Welcome to the 30 Americans Get the Word Out podcast. And this is Trey. And they mom. And we are here due to the service learning project between the Jocelyn and Blackburn Alternative Program. We're here checking out the work and we're going to tell y'all all about it. And stay tuned for more. First time we came, there's a man named Kevin Lytle who told us the story of a rug. Uh, Let me tell you about the rug. The rug is, it's a huge rug that's been around for some centuries, I'm guessing, right? For some centuries. Yeah, when you look at it, it's it's stained up, dirty. What was on it? I think you said it was blood on it and some more stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it don't smell. It smells. Crucial. It's it don't smell right. Um, I don't know. When you know when it was made? It was made a couple BCs back. I don't even know. It was just in a. It was just in a uh, in a house in a village, a couple BCs back. Oh, so this rug, old, old. Yeah, yeah so the. Old, old. I don't even know how they knew how to make a rug. I don't even know how they know the word rug. You right. Man, they must have been thugging for real, thugging harder than us. It's been around for some years, but the rug. And when you come and see it, when you come and visit the Joslin, and you see the rug. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna be surprised because you, it's it depend how you see this it, crazy art. It's stupid big too. Oh God. Yeah, like nine feet tall. You would you would not notice. You wouldn't be ready for that. Me. You would not know that. You would never think. You would never think a piece of rug is a is art. All this beautiful art, and then you look over and see a rug. It you, gives always an explanation for everything. Right. So we, we here to tell you about. Yeah. And now here's Kevin Lino's story about the rug. While I'm talking, you're hearing and listening, but zone in on the carpet. Pay attention to all of the details. Think of everything that it might be saying to you or not saying to you. And then just have my words be as a soundtrack. Day mom, you like this? Yeah. Yeah. What about it? I know you got one particular work that you dig, but. Uh, it's just all of them different. They all take different stuff. Different, uh, all of them tell a different story. Absolutely. Absolutely. They all do tell a different story. And so you all have seen all of this beautiful work. And now you get to meet me. And I am Atlantis Jenkins. Now, most of you can just call me Carpet. Now, I don't know when I was born. I can't tell you where I was created, but I can tell you that I learned about the world in 1619. I was in a beautiful village back in Africa around kings and queens and warriors, hunters, gatherers. This one particular day, there was a lot of commotion, a lot of pain, a lot of tears. There were tears being dropped on me. And all I could see were men, women, and children being rushed off and taken to all of these different boats. I too was rolled up and thrown on this boat. The world, there's more than Africa, so I get to see it. I'm excited. But the sounds that I would take in, the stains that I would take in, there was a mother who gave birth to twins on me. That was the first time I experienced both life and death as that mother didn't make it. They even talked about rolling that mother up in me and throwing us both over into the Atlantic. Just so you know, that's how I got my name, Atlantis. I made it to this new space that we are currently in from my home in Africa across the Atlantic Ocean. And it was at that moment that I knew that I 
had a purpose. I had meaning. Me, a carpet. So, 1739. We're on this big grassy plain and there are many people who look like the people from my village and from my home in Africa, except for they no longer had power. They no, no longer had influence as they did back home. There were other people who didn't look like us, who didn't sound like us, who had all the power, who had all the control, who made all the decisions. It was one evening I can remember very, very clear. Well, there was a lot of movement on me. I remember the small table that sat in the corner and it just rocked and rocked. And I thought it was going to fall on me and make incredible damage. But instead, what I really felt was the pain of this woman as she screamed as her master, master. That was a word that I would never forget when I heard that. Master. As her master did things to her that not only physically stained me, but mentally stained me. 1865, this was also another day that I would never forget. Mother was on top of me folding clothes and there was all of this loud cheering and all of this joy outside of our cabin. And brother and sister run in and said, mama, mama, guess what, guess what? And very calmly mama said, what? They said, we are finally free. We are finally free. Now as a carpet, I'm thinking we are finally free. I know that we were in this one space for so long, but now I get to experience more of this new world. Does freedom mean that we finally have control? Does freedom mean that we finally have influence? I guess that I will find out. 1916, as you can see, I'm having a long life from 1619 from Africa to this place that I would now know is called America. I am just traveling and I am feeling and I am seeing all of these things, experiencing all of these people, taking in all of these stories, becoming a story myself. 1916, a mother, a father and a son we're in a one room apartment and in this apartment, doors are slamming, forces are being raised and there's a mother standing in the corner of me, silent as the father and the son stand in the middle and they argue. And the son says, the father says, no son of mine will go off to this war. This war is not for us. This country is not for us. We don't belong here. And the father, the son says, we're free now. This is our home. I demand the right to fight for our home, to fight for our family, to fight for our freedom continuously. So I am going to this war. And again, the mother stands dropping tears on me silently. Fast forward. 1963. I've traveled from Africa I've traveled from the South, I've traveled to the Midwest, I've even traveled East Coast, and now I'm back down South, I'm in Alabama, and there are about 25 people who look like the people from my original village who are standing around, they're drinking on me, they're spilling on me, there's crumbs, I wish that I could taste what it was that they were eating because they seemed to enjoy it, but all I got was the dirt from it. I guess that's just the life of a carpet. It was this box and this box kept kind of irritating me because I could recognize every voice and every person inside of the room that was standing on me. But there was this voice, this voice that was ringing loud and it was coming from this box that sat in the middle of me while everyone sat around this box. And all I heard was I have a dream. Free at last, free at last. Thank God almighty. We're free at last. That word freedom again and that joy that my people felt again. Now, this time it was different. I had witnessed oppression. I had witnessed a people lose themselves and fight and fight and fight to gain themselves over the years from 16, 19. And now at this moment with this man that I heard them re referred to as Dr. King would say we are free at last. 
I felt a new sense of pride from my people and me myself as carpet. I was prideful too. I had this long life and I seen all of this pain and now I was finally starting to see some progress. I made it to the East Coast in 1979. It was fast paced in the East Coast, New York to be exact, the Bronx. 1979, there was this group of young men and again, a good 20 or 30 of them. And I thought that it was beat the carpet day because they just kept jumping on me and jumping on me and jumping on me. And all I heard was hip, hop, hip, hop. I would learn that this thing called hip hop that had this language and this dance and this movement would grow to be this multi-billion dollar industry and culture full of people who look like the people from my village back in 1619. Now, I don't have much memory for about 20 years after that because unfortunately, there was this day in the 80s and as you can see, I am stained up. And all I remember were that there were these women and they were on top of me and they were lifeless and there was this red stuff coming out of me. And so I was rolled up and I was taken to this place where they recycle carpets and I was just left there. And I thought that that would be the last of my days. But in 2008, this group of young people who came and gave me life again, they were building this club and they needed carpet. And so they had a table and they had a couch and they now had a bigger box that not only had sound, but it had people moving on this box. I guess they called it a TV. Whatever it was, at least I can finally see where the voices were coming from. On there, one day, late 2008, just like in 1963 when I was hearing this voice that says, I have a dream and free at last, there was another voice of another man who looked, who had the same complexion as this, as this man that I would hear about in 1963. But this man... I guess he became some type of president or something because he just kept saying, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And the people around me kept screaming, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And that pride all over again came. So now, fast forward, 2019. I was resurrected. I was able to continue to travel. And now I get to hang out with you all. I'm Carpet, and thank you for listening to my story. So, everything that I just said, I'm a storyteller, in addition to being an educator, in addition to being a community worker and all of these things, I get to write and create stories that, that, that tell about things and about people. And so, yes, this was a story that I created. Uh, there were dates and people in there that were absolutely real, but the narrative itself was something that I created. Now, my question is, why do you think I created a story or a narrative about a carpet? Because it's been around forever. Because it's been around forever, absolutely, absolutely. What else? Seen a lot of things. Yes, yes, for sure. Been through a lot. Been through a lot, absolutely. So all of those things are correct, except for in a building with over 60 pieces of artwork, all talking about African-American history and culture and pain and triumph, in the middle of all of that work, you got a piece of carpet. A piece of carpet that is hanging here. It has, it's cut out and it's torn a certain way and it has all of these stains and cuts and you can see where furniture sat and all of that, but it is still, in our eyes, a piece of carpet. So there are many people who walk through here and they wonder, how does this belong? Why is this here? But you all just said it. It's seen a lot. It's been through a lot. It's ha it has its own story. And it's important that anything that has a story, that story be told. Because if it's not, it falls into a category called absent narratives. Where there is a history, where there is, a, there is an experience, 
that means something to someone or something. But if it is not told, then that thing or that place or that time period gets erased. Now, we don't know what this carpet been through, but it did go through something. We can see it. it's written all over this kind of figurative face of the carpet. Just like we can look at people through their smile and through their frowns and all of those things and we can see that they have experience. They have a story. They have life about them. And sometimes you got to dig deep to figure out what that is. And once you do, you figure out that it matters. It means something. Just like the life and story of this carpet. We had some time to think about this story and how it made us feel. And then that later influenced us to make our own narrative on our favorite pieces of art. Thanks for listening. We hope you come to the Johnson Art Museum to see the 30 Americans in the Rodney McMillan Untitled Carpet. 30 Americans is on view at the Johnson Art Museum until Sunday, May 5th. Come back in a week to hear from other students.